This week, we're in the second week of our three-week series on parenting. And I recognize, as I mentioned last week, that not all of us are parents. I believe that uh, if you are not a parent, I really believe that God will speak to you, that there is something relevant in today's message for your life, either in relation to your parents, either in, in helping out parents, or in relation to people in your life that you're seeking to influence. So I really believe that God will speak to all of us this morning as we look at this topic of parenting. Now, back when I was a child, right, going back now, before cell phones, before the internet, before microwave popcorn, back when I was a child, summertime was free time to play and run around. My schedule, my calendar was wide open. Even as a high school student, I spent most of the summer hanging out with family and friends, a lot of that time with friends in our church youth group. My, how times have changed. Times have changed, right? Times have changed. Now, we've got summer school and all kinds of summer camps and sports practice and music lessons and tutoring and art and dance and the list of activities just even grows once school starts. As Andy Stanley points out, we now live in a culture where parents can feel tremendous pressure to give their kids the right package of experiences to help them get ahead in life. Do any parents know what I'm talking about? There, there can be this, this pressure. I know I feel this pressure. Our, our oldest son, Micah, you know, he just finished seventh grade. And I remember a, a dad coming up and asking me, is your son doing summer school? No. And he's like, well, he really should do summer school. He should probably take math because he, you want him in advanced math in eighth grade because that way in ninth grade he can take this and then and then and this and it all leads up to college, right? So like you got to be strategic with your seventh grader or it's not going to work out right in college. And, and there can be this, this pressure, this sense that if I don't give my kid the right experiences, somehow they're going to be left behind or somehow they're going to miss out on a, a rich, full childhood. Here's the danger in this, as Andy Stanley points out. In the long run, the activities that consume our time and resources as children have very little to do with what happens to us as adults. In the long run, the relationships that we have as children matter a lot more than the activities that we do. You see, we know as adults that when you get to your 30s, 40s, and 50s and beyond, it's your ability to develop mature and rich relationships that makes life worth living. If you can't maintain healthy relationships, you can't make it in the world. Relationships are the most important thing in life. Relationships, not activities, are what matter most. Now, if that's true, if relationships are what matter most, then what are the key relationships for a child? I want to list three. I have a, a slide. We're going to look at this over the next two weeks. Relationships, key relationships for a child. The relationship with God, the relationship with parents, with their parents, and the relationship with others outside the home. Those are the, the, the three key sets of relationships for a child. We're going to spend this morning and next week looking at these three and how we as parents can influence our children in all three. And this morning, we're going to focus in on number one. We're going to focus in on the relationship that, according to Scripture, is the most important relationship of all, our child's relationship with God. 
Today's scripture, out of Deuteronomy 6, contains one of the most famous verses in the Bible. It's the Shema, the, the central prayer in the Jewish prayer book, the prayer that many Jews recite at least twice a day. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. That's God's great desire for human beings. That's what it's all about. Loving God with all your heart, soul, and strength. When Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? He quoted Deuteronomy 6. He quoted the Shema. Love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And then he added, and the second greatest is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. God doesn't necessarily want our children to win the voice or to have a 4.0 or to score the winning goal. God's great desire for our children isn't that they be well-behaved or even that they be religious. Most of all, God wants our children to love God with every ounce of their being, to become men and women who have a relationship with God. So one of our primary responsibilities as parents is to help our children cultivate a relationship with God. Does that sound intimidating? Daunting? Above your pay grade? Now, most parents won't come out and say it, but in my first church in L.A., there was a dad who basically said, I don't do that. <laughs> like, I provide financially, <laughs> but that's your job, church. <laughs> not mine. <laughs> I can't do that as a dad. That's the church's job, not mine. Now, I don't think most of us would say this, but I think some of, the, some of us might think that, and we might think it because it sounds too intimidating. Like, how can I nurture, cultivate my child's relationship with God? See, whether our kids are 5 or 45, that's challenging. Because no parent controls what their children believe. I remember when Micah asked me, how do you know God exists? It's a great question. All of our kids are going to ask great questions. We can't simply give our kids faith. A relationship with God is ultimately a gift from God. It's a gift from God, but it's a gift that we as parents have influence in passing on. So how do our children develop a relationship with God? How do our children become people who love God? I want to mention two ways. Two ways that we can influence our children spiritually. First is modeling. Modeling. If we want our children to develop a relationship with God, we need to model a relationship with God. When it comes to parenting, things are caught more than they are taught. That's like my number one principle of parenting. Things are caught more than they are taught. Kids are going to pick up whatever we as parents are passing on. As one pastor puts it, children have never been very good at listening to their parents, but they have never failed to imitate them. Amen? I think we're hesitant to say amen to that. As parents, <laughs> whether we like it or not, we are Xeroxing ourselves. We are shaping and influencing another human life by what we model. Now, we can see this in big and small ways, right? I'll give you just a tiny example from my life. My kids, as you guys know, are really into sports. They run around playing soccer, playing tennis, playing all these sports. And I've noticed, I noticed this a few years ago, but they would often stand on the field like this. And I would look and go, why are they standing like that? That just looks kind of goofy. And your arm should be like this, right? Not like this. I'm like, why are they doing that? And guess what I realized? That's how I stand. I do this. <laughs> they learned that from me. It's a tiny example, but I bet you each and every one of us can think of those same examples in our own life. 
what we model for our children on a daily basis gets passed on to them. Deuteronomy 6 says, impress these commands on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. In other words, cultivating a relationship with God is something that we do in everyday life. Sitting in our living room or going for a walk to the park. It takes place in the posters on our wall and the music that we listen to. It takes place when we put our kids to bed and when we wake them up in the morning. It takes place in everyday life, and it starts with us. Deuteronomy 6 tells parents to pass on these commandments to their children, but that's the second step. Here's the first step. Keep these commandments in your heart. It's got to be in our heart before it can be passed on to our kids. As parents, we can't take our children where we haven't been. We can't give away what we don't have. If we want a love for God to grow in our children, it must first grow in our hearts. According to Scripture, whatever is in our heart spills out into our life, and whatever spills out into our life is picked up by our kids. Anyone find that very convicting? I find that very convicting. Whatever is in our heart spills out into our life, and whatever spills out into our life is picked up by our kids. So if my heart is full of anger and frustration because of something going on at work, or bound by an addiction, or shut down because I'm unhappy in my marriage, that's going to spill out and get picked up by my kids. They're going to be influenced by that, whether I acknowledge it or not. And if my heart is hungry for God, if it longs for God's presence and, and lives for God's purposes, if it is growing in grace and forgiveness, that's going to spill out and, and get picked up by my kids. They're going to be influenced by that, whether I acknowledge it or not. So one of the greatest gifts I can give my kids is to allow God to do heart surgery on me, to do the internal, relational, spiritual work of honestly addressing what is in my heart. If we want to influence others toward God, the place to start is our own heart, our own relationship with God. Modeling. That's the first way we influence our, our children's relationship with God. So for those of you who are parents here this morning, I'd like to ask you, what are you modeling for your children? Just take a minute to, to ask this question to yourself. What am I modeling for my children? Am I modeling a relationship with God that comes first? Am I modeling loving God with all my heart, soul, and strength? Modeling, number one. Here's the second way we influence our children spiritually. Teamwork. Cultivating our children's relationship with God is a team sport. It is not a one-person sport. It is not a two-person sport. It is a team sport. And that's one reason I am so committed to the local church. One reason I'm so committed to being part of a church ohana, because nurturing spiritual growth takes a team. I can tell you for absolutely sure, if the only people who influenced my relationship with God were my mom and dad, there was no way I would be standing up here right now. There is absolutely no way. I am standing up right here right now seeking to pursue a relationship with God because when I was in elementary school, middle school, high school, and college, there were parents, there were adults who invested in me and helped cultivate a relationship with God in my life. I think about when I was 15, I moved from, Calif from Washington to California between my sophomore and junior year of high school. That's kind of a tough time to move to move states. I didn't know anyone. I could have gone all kinds of directions. As a 15-year-old, I wasn't necessarily wanting to hang out with mom and dad. I got connected to a church, and there was a youth group. And in that youth group, there was a volunteer who served named James Blair. James didn't have any kids in the youth group. 
but James invested in the youth group. He came to youth group every Sunday. He led a Bible study in his house every week that I was part of. We liked to play basketball, so we played basketball together a lot. We'd go out and grab food. He invested in my life. He spent time with me. He built a relationship with me so that I could build a relationship with God. When I was thinking about college, two years into that relationship, I was thinking about Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. James said, I went there, I'll take you up there and give you a tour. So we went up there for a couple days. There were so many big and small ways where he invested in my life. He helped me develop a relationship with God as part of a team that was doing that within our church. I so desperately am grateful for that. And I'm so grateful for those of you in this church family who do that. I was thinking about John Kojima. John is here. But I was thinking John is a father and a grandfather. And John is still deeply invested in our children's ministry. He still coordinates all the, the schedules. And I say, whose name and whose hair? Like, he, he keeps track of these things. And he and, you know, two folks who help uh, lead are acolytes. And I think he's led both Daniel and Michael and uh, Micah in Sunday school. And acolyte training and bought lunch for them and just done these different things. And I'm so glad for John's influence on my sons. I have influence over who my sons get to know. And I want to get them to get to know people in a church of Ohana who love God and want them to develop a relationship with God. See, when it comes to our children's ministry in particular, we need all hands on deck. We need that to do this significant, daunting work that we're called to do. When Cindy and I lived in San Diego, we were part of the San Diego Cooperative Charter School. It was a public school, but it was a co-op charter school. That meant if your kid went to the, went to the school, as parents, you invested 60 hours a year in the school. You were involved in the school if your kids went there. And I've realized, and this isn't anything new, but what I've realized in our church is that we need a co-op Sunday school program. If your children are in our Sunday school program, we need you as parents serving in the program. And we need that for the sake of our children. Now, I realize that for some people that may be challenging. I think of, you know, the Cunninghams who've got three kids and then infant twins. <laughs> it's kind of hard when you're juggling five young kids. But for 90% of us, we can do that. And I know this is not an expectation that we've asked before, but this is an expectation that we're seeking to develop this year, to build this culture into our church where every family that participates in Sunday school serves in Sunday school. So parents, if your child is participating in Sunday school, I am asking that you will serve in Sunday school. That could be behind the scenes. That could be teaching a class once a month. That you will serve in some capacity because we need each other. It takes a team. I want to be part of a church where we work together to nurture our children's relationship with God. I mentioned earlier that I had dinner this week with the holidays and as, as Josh and I were walking out after dinner to his car, I asked him, they live on Hickam Air Force Base. And I said, what's the neighborhood like? And, and he said to me, we all look out for each other because, you know, we all know what it's like to need that. We know what it's like to have one family member on deployment or gone for a period of time. So we all look out for each other because we know what it's like to need that. And I thought, that's a great statement of what the church should be, Right? In the church, we are called to look out for each other because we all know that we need that. As a church family, we want to take seriously our call to cultivate our children's relationship with God. Now, if you're not sure how to participate, I just want to let you know that there is a table every Sunday where you can sign up for Sunday school. And Christine McElwain is actually here this morning, and that is our children's ministry director. Just connect with her and ask, how can I help out? I want you to picture the children in our church. Close your eyes if you'd like. You can keep your eyes open. But I want you to just picture the children in your church. You maybe picture five of them. You may picture one, two. And I want you to picture them developing spiritually into the men and women we long for them to be. Picture that. Picture these kids that were up here. 
18, 19, 20, 25, into the men and women that we long for them to become. Picture them developing into young adults who love God with all their heart, soul, and strength. Now, as you picture that, I want to ask, where are they now? And what steps can we help them take to get there? What steps can you and I help them take to get there? We have an incredible opportunity in our church. We have so many kids running around. And they are teachable. They are impressionable. They are growing. Through modeling and teamwork, we can influence our children. We can partner together to introduce them to God and help them develop a lifetime and life-changing relationship with the one who made them and the one who loves them for eternity.